So um, I have to say, uh, of course, in my uh, usual busy life, like many of the people here, uh, when I was uh, asked to uh, speak and come to Madrid, that was a great opportunity. I was happy to come. Uh, but it was only within the uh, last uh, week or so that I uh, looked down at my notes and saw that I had been given this title uh, to speak about. Uh, and uh, I uh, immediately regretted my decision to say uh, yes. Um, I became very nervous because I think I'm uh, probably uh, the last person, at least amongst the uh, group of uh, very uh, august and uh, accomplished folks that you've had over the last two days, to talk about uh, uh, so a transformative uh, a topic as a transforming all of science and healthcare. So I'm afraid I'm not going to make uh, good on this title. Uh, but I will talk a little bit about the Martino Center, some of the things we do, some of the opportunities uh, we've had to push science uh, uh, and how some of those have managed to uh, propagate themselves into industry, uh, both uh, large and small, uh, perhaps uh, as an inspiration uh, for some, as an opportunity to uh, uh, look for uh, new um, collaborations uh, and as an uh, object lesson in uh, both uh, some successes as well as uh, some pitfalls along the way. Well, uh, since the topic of the uh, meeting was uh, innovation, I thought I would uh, uh, start by giving uh, some of my own uh, uh, insights and insights that I've gleaned from others uh, uh, over the years on uh, key concepts involved in innovation because, of course, uh, that's uh, very much key to uh, all of what we do uh, and is, in fact, the very mission of uh, the meeting that we've had here. So uh, looking through the web, I came up with uh, uh, this slide, which talked about uh, five uh, key stages of innovation that I thought was uh, worth sharing with the group. Uh, the first, of course, is that your uh, colleagues uh, deny that uh, any innovation is uh, really uh, required. Uh, they'll deny that uh, your ideas are uh, likely to be effective. Uh, they'll deny that uh, the innovation, even if you could get it to work, uh, is, uh, uh, is important. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, they'll uh, deny that uh, the uh, innovation would uh, possibly justify the effort it would take to do it. Uh, and uh, if you're lucky, then you finally uh, reach the uh, fifth stage of uh, innovation where they accept and adopt the innovation attributed to uh, other people uh, and then uh, deny the existence of uh, stages uh, one through four. Uh, this is uh, the story of my life and uh, uh, just uh, something you have to get used to. Uh, now, of course, uh, that's the principle of innovation overall, but uh, as uh, many have described over the last uh, couple days, innovation is really led by people uh, and especially the visionary people that seem to be the core of all the great uh, uh, technical uh, innovations that we've been discussing, really the driving force. So what are the traits that characterize uh, these uh, people? Uh, well, um, uh, there are a number of traits that investigators have uh, um, uh, looked at uh, over uh, time uh, that are um, characteristic of the innovative mind. Uh, these include things like uh, divergent thinking, the ability to pick unusual associations of ideas, switching rapidly from one set of ideas uh, to another. Uh, the flexibility, the ability to produce kind of different categories, different perceptions of uh, reality uh, than most everybody else around them. Uh, perseverance, the ability to stay focused on that idea, uh, as uh, somebody uh, yesterday said, uh, to wake up every morning and say, this is just the greatest thing in the world. Uh, that's what you need to do to press through all the hardships that uh, stand in your way. Uh, a preference for uh, disorder. Uh, we tend, uh, as uh, humans, as uh, um, uh, creatures of habit that we are, uh, to like things uh, exactly as they were day by day, uh, but uh, the innovative mind has to have a predilection uh, for a disarray, complexity, uh, asymmetry uh, in their life. Uh, and follow uh, and kind of a, a corollary to this, this notion of embracing uh, ambiguity, uh, the uh, inclination to find uh, strangeness, unusual things, uh, interesting and exciting. And all of these, I think, when we uh, heard the great uh, uh, stories of innovation over the last uh, uh, few days, I think we can see the characteristics in this. Uh, any of you who've uh, read uh, the uh, uh, wonderful biography of uh, Steve Jobs uh, will see uh, many of these uh, uh, traits, and this is the, uh, the case of many of our great innovators. Uh, but uh, when I looked at this list, it began, it seemed familiar to me, uh, something was jiggling uh, deep in my mind. I wasn't quite sure. And then I began to realize that, in fact, these were also uh, some of the uh, key uh, traits of the schizophrenic mind. Uh, divergent thinking is uh, what in uh, psychiatry you call looseness of association. Uh, the flexibility, uh, uh, different perceptions of reality. That's, of course, the delusions and hallucinations we see. 
uh, perseverant behavior is one of the key cardinal signs of uh, schizophrenic mind, the uh, inability to uh, get off things. Predilection for disorder is, of course, the disorganized and bizarre behavior we see all the time, and embracing ambiguity is kind of the key hallmark of thought disorder. So um, the line between innovation and craziness uh, can be a thin one, uh, and uh, that's just a part of <laughs> what we uh, live with uh, if we want to be in this world. You have to be a little crazy uh, in order to pursue these ideas. You just have to not be too crazy or people will lock you up and then you won't get to pursue your ideas. So keep that in mind. So uh, as uh, uh, Elfar mentioned, uh, my own area of interest is in the area of uh, medical imaging. Of course, in the broad area of uh, healthcare, there are many, many important innovations. Uh, but I'd like to argue that uh, imaging is certainly one of the uh, interesting uh, ones. Uh, this was a, a study done not too long ago where they actually asked uh, private uh, practice clinicians, uh, people day-to-day -day seeing patients, and asked them to rank order these 30 uh, innovations uh, in terms of their importance for their day-to-day -day practice. Uh, so you things, uh, things like bone marrow transplant, clearly a lifesaver for some patients, but a relatively small number of patients. Uh, Viagra was uh, only a 28 on this list, but uh, that was uh, before a decade's worth of advertisement on uh, uh, football and uh, soccer games, so perhaps it's uh, moved up a little bit. Uh, you can see other important things, coronary artery bypass graph, uh, statins, uh, but at the, all uh, very important discoveries, but at the very top, uh, CT and MRI. The ability to see our patient's pathology has in the uh, realm of uh, these clinicians fundamentally change the way they relate to their patients, their ability to make diagnosis, and their ability to make accurate uh, treatment decisions uh, rapidly uh, uh, and efficiently. There that is. Uh, we can move on. Okay. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the Martino Center, and then I'll tell you uh, what I think may be the more interesting story of the kind of work we do. Uh, we set out, uh, uh, it was more than a decade ago, Martha and I, uh, with uh, this vision. Uh, which was to create a world-leading uh, biomedical imaging center uh, under one roof, proximity being important, uh, 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 even though uh, the uh, ability to uh, telecommute uh, has improved over years, there's still nothing quite like seeing LFAR in the lab to have those hallway conversations, which combined uh, all the strengths at that time of the HST community, really the hallmarks, engineering and physical sciences, computation, basic and applied biology, imaging and radiological sciences, and the clinical science, and try to bring all of those forces uh, together into one place. Uh, not so easy to do, but in fact, we've had some success. Uh, the way HST has uh, taught me to think about this is in this model of these uh, kind of triumvirate of uh, forces, uh, technology, uh, basic biology, uh, and uh, clinical medicine. And it's really the uh, interface of all of these that really uh, is this place that uh, uh, HST lives. It's the place where I see uh, Envision is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, living, uh, and it's uh, what we try to uh, encapsulate uh, within our uh, uh, imaging environment, uh, one uh, small facet of the overlap of these domains. But of course, uh, when we actually tried to uh, institute this, we realized that while we could bring many of those forces uh, together, the te technology, the biology, clinical medicine, uh, within uh, the Martina Center itself, it could really only exist and, and fruitfully exist, uh, not in a vacuum, but surrounded by uh, the, uh, the uh, broader communities that we had to draw upon uh, for many of our uh, innovations, for many of the key technical insights we had, and of course for the opportunity to disseminate our technology more broadly. And this, of course, included uh, the institutions at the core of HST, MIT and Harvard, who brought uh, uh, predominantly engineering and biology, uh, Harvard uh, physicists and biologists, the Mass General with its clinicians in addition to its basic biologists, but also included industry. Uh, as you'll see uh, uh, through the course of the talk, key uh, engineers and physicists within uh, the medical imaging uh, uh, community, the largest uh, um, uh, patron of ours uh, in this domain was uh, Siemens, uh, and also the pharmaceutical industry and increasingly small companies that build up from this. Now, these are just some numbers, uh, not especially recent, just to give you a sense for the scope of the Martino Center. Uh, something today on the order of uh, uh, 40 or $45 million a year uh, in uh, total costs, uh, and we've managed to uh, grow even through the relatively tight uh, uh, NIH times. Uh, what I think is uh, most interesting here uh, is the fact, oops, 
let's go on, that uh, we now uh, constitute something like 10% of the MGH research portfolio. It's about a 60, $650 million portfolio of research at the Mass General Hospital. About 10% of that utilizes the resources of the Martino Center. Uh, and I think uh, what's uh, important and uh, gratifying for us is that more than half of these grants come from investigators from outside the center itself. So while the core of the center uh, certainly is a, a key constituent of what we do, it's our outreach to the broader community, both in clinicians at the Mass General, uh, physical scientists and engineers, computer scientists at MIT, and in fact colleagues from all over uh, the city, the country, and the world who come utilize the resources and collaborate with us that give us uh, our uh, greatest strength. Uh, it's this combination of the core and the surround and the ability to interact between them that I think is uh, a hallmark, at least of the model that we've been uh, promulgating. So uh, we start with kind of a basic uh, hypothesis uh, in the realm of uh, medical imaging. Uh, and it comes perhaps from uh, one uh, that I've uh, had uh, embedded in me from my interests uh, that uh, in science that go uh, back uh, many, many years, uh, that uh, great tools uh, to see can lead uh, to great discoveries. Now, my own uh, interest before I got involved in medical imaging was uh, imaging of a different kind, uh, and that's uh, astronomical imaging. My undergraduate degree was in astronomy, uh, and of course, uh, we all know the fundamental contributions that uh, Galileo Galilei was able to make when he had a new instrument to see, uh, including uh, spots on the sun and their characteristic uh, rotation, uh, the craters and structures of the moon, uh, the uh, detailed stars within, in this case, the Pleiades, and the fact that the Milky Way was actually constituted of millions of stars and uh, wasn't visible before, uh, and perhaps the discovery that had the most uh, fundamental uh, change in the way we perceived the universe at that time uh, was the observation of the Galilean uh, moons around Jupiter. And in fact, it, uh, this was a, a quote uh, translated into English uh, from his uh, uh, definitive uh, work, uh, where he uh, basically uh, described that it was the observation of this kind of mini-universe, uh, moons moving around uh, Jupiter, that gave the uh, strongest uh, uh, push uh, to the Copernican system and uh, uh, was able to essentially pull the rug out from under all the arguments uh, supporting uh, Ptolemaic uh, organization of the universe, a fundamental way to change our perception of the universe. But of course, uh, that hasn't uh, uh, stopped uh, from uh, his work uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, look at uh, what we've learned about the universe uh, from this new instrument, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. I'll just give one example, but again, one that's made a fundamental change to our understanding of the universe. This comes from a paper that uh, colleagues at both Harvard and MIT have made important uh, contributions to, uh, observations in this case of evidence from a supernova, and the key here is this notion of an accelerating universe, the fact that not only is our universe expanding, of course, uh, uh, Shapley uh, observed that, but it's accelerating in its expansion, uh, and the point is that those observations came from a new instrument able to see deeper into space, able to make measurements that had never been made before, and as a result, we now understand the universe in a fundamental way uh, uh, and in a different way than we had before. And the implications, of course, of this dark energy that's pushing our universe apart um, uh, haven't uh, uh, even begun, uh, but uh, no doubt they're going to be profound, not only for the field of cosmology, but perhaps uh, for uh, uh, many uh, processes here on Earth. Well, uh, so now let's shift to the kind of imaging that we do from outer space into uh, inner space, if you will. Uh, and I'll highlight kind of two key innovations that have happened uh, over the last uh, uh, dozen years or so that the Martino Center has been in existence uh, that really have uh, pushed a lot of the technology uh, development and a lot of the applications in our work. One is towards uh, imaging with magnetic resonance at higher magnetic fields, uh, and the other is the uh, developments in using uh, uh, massively parallel array systems for the detection. Uh, and here's just an image uh, uh, from uh, a high field scanner that takes advantage of both of those. Now, uh, the notion of uh, what I'll call Tesla envy, uh, the desire for ever greater magnetic fields, magnetic fields, of course, measured in the units of uh, Tesla, uh, has been an interesting one, uh, really, uh, since the very beginning of uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And it's been an interesting kind of push and pull between academia uh, and industry in terms of who's been leading the way. 
Uh, in the very early days, uh, for those of you who uh, uh, may know some of the early history of MRI, there were great battles between the industrial uh, giants at the time, uh, Diasonics and General Electric, uh, led by these gentlemen, uh, Leon Kaufman and uh, Bill Edelstein, fighting it out over which was the optimal field. And of course, not surprising, uh, Leon Kaufman said the optimum was 0.35T because that's what his company, Diasonics, made. Uh, uh, Bill Edelstein said, no, higher field is best. Uh, it turns out uh, perhaps less because of the data that suggested it was better, uh, but because nobody else could make high field magnets at that time besides uh, GE. So that uh, perhaps uh, tilted the uh, economic uh, uh, discussion uh, to their advantage at the time. But interestingly, once uh, we got to the 1.5T scanner, uh, things seemed to be pretty stable for some time until certain academic sites began to push. And we were certainly uh, amongst the early sites to push for higher fields, and not just as research instruments, but as clinical instruments built on clinical platforms. At the time, we were actually a, uh, uh, had a partnership with General Electric when we went to their senior executives and said, no, it's time to double the field strengths. Uh, had this quote uh, uh, from an uh, uh, unnamed uh, General Electric executive who said, uh, there will never be a 3T Cigna. Uh, and uh, we were very pleased a few years later when the very first uh, 3T GE Cigna came into the Mass General Hospital. So uh, never say never, uh, at least uh, don't be uh, quoted as it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, just to uh, give, uh, give to, uh, uh, you know, uh, all uh, equally, uh, when we uh, began our partnership uh, with Siemens a few years uh, later, uh, and we wished uh, to then double the field strength again, a little bit more, go up to 70, uh, the quote was, well, we're really not that interested in the 7T, and in fact, really not all that interested in 3T even at that time, for that matter. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, this push to higher field, which was one that was driven by academia, uh, has had important consequences, not just for our uh, basic science abilities, but also uh, for the industrial applications uh, in MR, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. So we've talked a lot about uh, innovation uh, to address needs. Uh, a lot was said that... Uh, you know, the uh, discovery that didn't, uh, wasn't matched to a particular need is often a discovery that uh, doesn't go anywhere. Uh, no doubt that is a good general rule, but it's been somewhat surprising, uh, uh, at least to me in this case, that although each of the innovations in, say, uh, the uh, advent of higher and higher field strengths has been motivated around a particular clinical need, in the end, once the instruments were developed, the, the true applications, the most important applications, were actually in areas that were unanticipated. For example, in the early development of the 1.5T echo planar high-speed imaging system, everybody thought that these would be used for cardiac imaging because the pulsatile motion of the heart required high-speed imaging. But in fact, it was that instrument that allowed us to do our first innovations in the first human brain mapping functional uh, imaging experiments, and that's led to an explosive growth uh, in the field of uh, cognitive uh, neuroscience. Uh, 3T imaging, again, we thought that would be neuroimaging, but it turns out clinically, perhaps the most important applications have been in body and musculoskeletal imaging, although, of course, we use the tool for neuroimaging as well. And at even higher fields, we really thought that this would be the perfect machine for functional imaging and magnetic resonance spectroscopy, things really starved for signal and noise, and surprisingly, it all came back around again, and perhaps the most compelling utilization of the highest field systems are back to basic anatomy. So uh, while need is important, it's also uh, worthwhile to keep in mind that we need to keep our eyes open to other opportunities, perhaps outside the needs we originally uh, envisioned our technology to be developed for. Uh, I'll just give a, a, a simple example of that. Um, uh, when we developed our 7T scanner, as I said, it was mostly uh, focused on uh, function, perhaps if uh, the lights uh, might uh, come down just a little bit. Uh, here we uh, looked at the function of the brain uh, within the visual system and asked a very simple question. We know, for example, that the retina in the eye projects back into the brain in a very regular pattern, the so-called retinotopic distribution in the visual cortex. Uh, so, for example, if we wanted to activate a part of the visual cortex in the shape of this letter M, we would uh, project into the visual field onto the retina a letter M, it would have some geometric distortions, and we understand these distortions, so we can essentially uh, uh, reverse engineer uh, this distorted M in the retina to then give us uh, the uh, undistorted M in the visual cortex. And the question is, could we actually see that in the brain? Uh, well, when you look at the folded cortex, of course, you can't really see much at all, but if you computationally inflate that cortex, take the crumpled sheet of the cortex uh, and unfold it, 
in fact, that M becomes readily visible. Not much visible. That was the way people used to look at the imaging in the crumpled cortex format. If you do it on the inflated cortex, you can actually see the M directly on the visual cortex. Here it is uh, right then and there. Now, we thought we would try to uh, spell out for one of our uh, grants uh, the name of our grant, the Center for Functional Neuroimaging Technologies, uh, well, we kind of uh, ran out after uh, MGH, but uh, at least it uh, got us a start. Uh, but it does uh, uh, pose an interesting question because the primary visual cortex activates when we imagine scenes, not just when we're seeing them, but when we have visual imagery, or for that matter, when we're dreaming. We know that that also activates the primary visual cortex. The question is, can we see your thoughts, what you're thinking about, uh, or can we uh, read your dreams? Uh, and uh, this is not just a rhetorical question. There are cognitive scientists today that are using the tool of functional imaging to actually allow us to reconstruct visual scenes, uh, not based on what uh, somebody's seeing, but what they're directly uh, uh, imagining through uh, interrogation of their brain forms. So as I mentioned, when we first uh, uh, did this uh, uh, imaging, we imagined that functional imaging would be the uh, greatest application. But it turns out probably clinically what we've been most surprised by and what we've gotten the, the greatest impact from is just the exquisite views of the anatomy. Here's just a blow up of that image that I showed before. Uh, and even in greater detail, uh, you can see the exquisite ability to see the vasculature, to see discrimination of laminar layer structures within the cortex, many features that we just weren't able to see before without the power of the higher field imaging and array coils. This has allowed us, for example, to see uh, the multiple substructures within the hippocampus, some of which are critical for uh, the development of early Alzheimer's disease. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, uh, others have uh, given us a surprising view of uh, diseases, in some cases diseases that we've studied for many, many years. In the history of MRI, the study of multiple sclerosis uh, is uh, famous because, in fact, it was probably the first uh, so-called killer app for MRI. It was the first uh, disease that could not be seen with the dominant technology at the time, uh, computed tomography, uh, and was essentially made as a diagnosis of, of exclusion by neurologists at the time. MR was the first to be able to see the white matter lesions uh, in the brain. And of course, uh, we can go to higher field strength and we still see those white matter lesions. The question is, however, is MS a disease of only the white matter? And the answer is that pathologists have told us for many years that the answer is no. That while clinically, when we do images, we look at the white matter and we characterize the white matter disease, we know that the correspondence between the imaging picture and what the patients look like uh, is correlated, but the correlation coefficient isn't that high. There's a discordance between the radiologic appearance and the clinical manifestation of the disease. And one possibility is that it's a reflection of the fact that the disease does not only involve the white matter, it also involves the gray matter. Pathologists have characterized lesions uh, uh, in a number of different kinds, so-called type 1 lesions at the border between the gray and the white matter, type 2 lesions kind of uh, smack in the middle of the cortex and type 3 lesions that extend from the peel surface, the outer surface, down into the brain. And our question was, could we use high field imaging to actually see those? Uh, and the answer is now yes, uh, that all these basic types of imaging, uh, the type 1, type 2, and type 3 uh, lesions, we can now see in the cortex, in the gray matter, and not just see lesions in the white matter, which now allows us to see essentially the, half, the other half of the disease that was missing for many years. Uh, these uh, just were not visible uh, at lower field strength due to the different contrast properties and reduced uh, signal to noise. The result of this is that we're now able, with our imaging modalities, to see the same type of lesions that the histopathologists have been seeing, but of course, now we can do so uh, longitudinally. In our living patients, we can see the response to different drugs on the uh, cortical disease versus the subcortical or white matter disease. Um, we can understand the uh, pathologic evolution of the gray matter disease. Some suggest that some of the diseases, such as the subpeel disease, extends from the peel surface and then moves from the gray matter into the white matter. That's impossible to study pathologically because you don't have the fourth dimension of time. Now that we can see these things in vivo, we do, uh, and we think we'll have uh, important implications for how we understand it. Now, I mentioned there was another technology between, besides high field. The challenge with high field imaging, uh, as important as it is, is that we needed a large industrial partner. 
ones like uh, initially GE, more recently Siemens, to help us move to higher field uh, just because the physical investment in those high field magnets is something that's outside the scope of what an academic lab can do. However, it's important to note that there's lots that can be done really at the level uh, of a small laboratory, an academic lab, and that give opportunities for small companies. And I think the work that uh, Elfar Adelsteinson uh, and his colleague at the Martino Center, Larry Wald, have done in the area of array coil design is really a fundamentally uh, great example of that. Um, uh, here is a number of model systems, as you can see, uh, a kind of home-built prototypes but really have allowed us to go from single receiver channels into these massive arrays of uh, close to 100 channels, and uh, the next generation will probably be uh, pushing 300 channels. Um, here's just an example of a, a, an early prototype. Looks a little scary. Uh, we call this the Franken coil, uh, and uh, uh, if you, uh, you know, were to ask uh, you know, your mother to climb into the magnet and put her head into that thing, she might uh, have a pause uh, for concern. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, these early coils have shown significant clinical impact. Here was, for example, the uh, image of the patient using the conventional coil technology at the time, a single channel uh, head coil in a patient with epilepsy, uh, read as normal, and as a result, basically a patient relegated to uh, a lifetime of uh, poor medical control uh, with uh, moderately toxic drugs. Now, just with uh, the improved uh, array coil technology developed by uh, uh, Larry Wald and his colleagues, we can now see that this little area here, you never would have called it from this image, but now you can see the presence of the different uh, contrast properties in that little part of the brain. An even high res higher resolution image shows what's uh, called a cortical migration abnormality during brain development. A few cells get left behind. That's the epileptic focus in this patient. This patient can now be uh, operated on and can be seizure-free, in fact, uh, was seizure-free. Now, of course, these two technologies go uh, beautifully together, the high-field imaging uh, and these coil arrays. Here's another example, a patient with 1.5T uh, imaging, state-of-the-art imaging, read as uh, normal, uh, both in outside films and even by radiologists uh, at the Mass General. Of course, uh, we believe amongst the best in the world, uh, but it was the 7T scan that you can see here that, again, uh, identified one of these cortical migration abnormalities. In fact, the smallest lesions are the very best lesions to find because they're the easiest to operate on and have the highest uh, uh, benefit. The problem is finding them, and these technologies make an important difference in this case uh, for the lives of these individual patients. Uh, now, uh, how have we uh, uh, promulgated this technology? Of course, we've shared this with our academic colleagues. Uh, Larry and his colleagues have uh, 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 built uh, coils and showed uh, many groups around the world how to use this technology, but perhaps of more relevance uh, for this group, we've been able to take this kind of prototype image and commercialize it into this system, uh, which is now uh, sold uh, by uh, Siemens, built and, and sold by Siemens. Our technology was licensed to them. It's now a 510K uh, cleared product. Uh, they've now uh, uh, shipped uh, hundreds of these. Uh, and I will say uh, it's not limited to just Siemens. Uh, that we've now signed a license agreement uh, with a small company, XLR, which is uh, uh, about to uh, release their first product. Uh, they're targeting uh, uh, Philips and GE uh, customers, but we'll also try to see if they can compete with Siemens uh, and uh, other established coil companies uh, based, uh, uh, based on price. Uh, very interestingly, the M Plus Vision uh, team, one of the teams, is now working on the next generation not of the parallel reception technology, but the parallel transmission technology, kind of the counterpoint to the reception technology that you just saw, uh, and is uh, uh, making uh, great progress on innovations to try to improve that facet of the uh, RF chain uh, to allow us to uh, study uh, diseases uh, more efficiently and more effectively by reducing the exposure to radio frequency uh, energy uh, during the process of transmission and to develop the computational tools to be able to do so efficiently. Uh, there are, of course, other kinds of spin-off technologies that are very suitable to small companies. Another licensed technology developed by uh, Giorgio uh, Bon Massar is the so-called uh, INCAP uh, technology. Uh, one of the challenges in reading things like uh, EEG in the presence of the large magnetic fields and switched magnetic fields we use for imaging is that, of course, that, that uh, not only leads to artifacts on the EEG, the measurement of the electrical activity in the brain, uh, but also as a potential hazard to the patients because of the interaction of those fields and the ability to generate heat. So uh, generating uh, high conductance uh, 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 
MR uh, invisible uh, uh, leads uh, to detect those signals and to do so safely for the patient has been another opportunity for uh, licensing that's come from this high field work. So what's the overall impact of this? Certainly uh, we've developed a variety of new uh, biomarkers for human disease that weren't apparent before. We've been able to make uh, better diagnoses, uh, which has led to uh, more effective treatments uh, at lower cost of uh, care over the lifetime of the patients. Uh, higher field, even though uh, we had uh, testimonials uh, from our corporate partners uh, that uh, it would never uh, go anywhere. In fact, it's something like a third of the world market uh, value today is in 3T uh, scanning, uh, and it's projected by some to be uh, more than uh, half uh, within the next five years. So this is a big part of the market, not a little part, and again, came from this industrial academic uh, partnership. Uh, and I think uh, in the realm of uh, innovation and small companies, certainly there have been multiple spin-off opportunities uh, from these kind of technical developments. Now there have been another of, uh, a number of other developments, again, in the same space of collaboration uh, at uh, the large scale, leading to both uh, innovations with large scale corporate partners and opportunities for small spin-offs. Another one which you heard a little bit about uh, earlier today uh, from uh, Siemens Corporate R&D is in the area of uh, uh, PET and MR scanning and the integration of those two. Here is actually the first uh, human molecular uh, imaging uh, scanner, the combination of MR and PET uh, into a, a single modality, in this case for uh, brain imaging. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, same, and you've already seen this, uh, the buildup uh, of a now whole body system which integrates these two into a single uh, clinical framework. Let's see if we can uh, go on. Here. There we go. Now, uh, why would we care about such a device? Well, one motivation for this, certainly within the area of uh, brain imaging, that's uh, my own personal interest, uh, comes from looking at this. If you look at the developed world and look at the global burden of disease, which not only uh, counts uh, morbidity, uh, mortality, but also uh, lifetime morbidity, when you uh, look at it uh, that way, it turns out that, um, as you can see, uh, you know, six of the top ten uh, major causes of disability in the developed uh, world uh, uh, relate to uh, the brain. Uh, and in particular, things like uh, major depression, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, substance abuse <laughs> disorders, uh, diseases associated with a traumatic uh, brain injury, uh, all uh, move us from diseases of the physical structure of the brain often towards uh, diseases of the mind, if you will, diseases of behavior, uh, some of the most vexing and hardest to, uh, to study. Now, uh, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health at the uh, NIH, uh, I interviewed uh, recently to ask him what he felt about these developments in imaging, and his first quote to me was, despite uh, 4,000 papers, no single imaging finding uh, has changed routine clinical care in psychiatry. Now, that's kind of a, a daunting and not especially a promising statement, but he did go on to say the following. He said by 2012, and this was only an interview a year ago, so uh, we have to make quick on this, uh, uh, on this um, uh, prediction. Um, prediction's always uh, difficult, especially about the future. Um, so, uh, but he said that this will change, and the change will arrive around a new definition of psychiatric disorders as disorders of brain circuitry, and that that definition will allow us to begin to change and understand the nature of the causes of the diseases, uh, their treatments, and ultimately, of course, their preventions. Now, uh, when I asked him for an example of this, he pointed to this work, the work of uh, Helen Mayberg, who is now using a circuit-based understanding of the brain that she developed from her work initially with positron emission tomography, PET, now combining PET and MR to identify parts of the region that are associated specifically with abnormalities in patients with depression, and then using that to target deep brain implantation in those patients who are medically refractory. In other words, uh, we're not getting better with any regimen of antidepressants. Uh, and she's shown remarkably effective results in that small cohort. And I think that this is really just the tip of the iceberg in the broad domain of neuroaugmentation that, again, has a tremendous opportunity for innovation along many lines. Uh, uh, in the imaging sense to identify the targets uh, and in the device sense to know how to deliver the energy there uh, most effectively uh, 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 and most non-invasively. Here she goes on and says that this neurochemical theory is now complemented by these brain circuit models, and of course it's this integration of neurochemistry and circuitry that's the perfect marriage of MR and PET, PET giving us the neurochemistry, MR giving us the neurocircuitry. 
Uh, here's just one example, uh, very quickly, from the work of uh, Josh Rothman uh, and our group looking at uh, dopamine antagonists, which can be measured directly with PET, and functional MR and anatomical MR studies, in this case to define the neurocorrelates for schizophrenia risk genes, very important if we can uh, help us understand the underlying biological uh, abnormalities. In another neurological disease, uh, uh, ALS, a, a neurodegenerative disease that involves the motor strip, we're now using PET uh, 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 ligands uh, looking at microglial activation, neuroinflammation markers, to see the localized uptake of uh, neuroinflammatory changes within the uh, uh, motor strip, and then relating that to what we're able to see on the MR images in terms of abnormalities within the cortical spinal tract. In Alzheimer's disease, of course, the excitement in PET imaging is now the use of agents that specifically bind to uh, uh, beta amyloid within the brain. Uh, so, for example, in a patient with uh, Alzheimer's disease, we will see the uptake of compounds like this uh, uh, Pittsburgh uh, imaging compound, the so-called PIB agent, uh, which is a hallmark of increased uh, beta amyloid. The problem in Alzheimer's, though, is an interesting one and really brings the two technologies together in their synergy, because while Patients with Alzheimer's are now known to have elevated uh, 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 amyloid. In fact, that's one of the pathologic hallmarks of the disease. We now understand that even uh, early in the disease uh, state, uh, during only mild cognitive impairment, patients also will show amyloid. In fact, more recent data has suggested that even prodromal, before there's any apparent cognitive abnormalities, there's the buildup of amyloid, and it raises the question whether in some patients, in fact, they may have increased amyloid but may not be vulnerable to the neurodegeneration associated with it. So the question is, now that there are new treatments coming out which are directly targeted towards amyloid and mobilizing them, who are we going to treat? Just seeing that they have amyloid is important necessary perhaps, but not sufficient for making a treatment decision on a very expensive treatment, but of course one that's becoming uh, increasingly imperative as our population ages and as Alzheimer's uh, explodes within our population. It may well be that MR data may offer that and its ability to quantify the neurodegeneration within the disease. It may allow us to localize where in the brain uh, and whether uh, the amyloid is actually having a biological effect on the brain, leading to neurodegeneration, but hopefully at the earliest stages here showing quite high uh, specificity and sensitivity, even in the earliest cognitive uh, impairment stages, exactly when you would want to treat. So it's likely, uh, we believe that it's the synergy between these two that will be important. Uh, and of course, it may be that in addition to uh, measuring uh, amyloid, we may also have to measure other molecular events because of the complexity of the molecular changes in Alzheimer's. For example, uh, this recent study that suggests that tau protein actually propagates through the brain uh, the way uh, prion diseases do, uh, and that may be one of the uh, earliest uh, events uh, uh, in, uh, um, in the development of Alzheimer's. It's uh, likely that we're going to have to image the molecular events associated with these tau changes as well. In fact, the very notion of imaging multiple molecular events is uh, not only uh, likely to be true as we look at neurotransmitters in the brain, as we look at diseases like Alzheimer's, but also as we look at neoplastic disease. Um, we know that there's tremendous uh, heterogeneity in human tumors related to the underlying genomic changes, that there's a whole evolution and heterogeneous local environment uh, within the tumors. How are we going to assess that? Which genetic changes have occurred and where have they occurred? Well, multimodal imaging both with MR approaches and we believe likely with multiple uh, 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 PET agents to look at different molecular events will be the key to assessing in vivo, quantitatively, uh, the multiple genetic uh, mut mutagenic effects uh, that are occurring in tumors, and that will be the key to uh, a precision treatment of those patients. So what's the M plus uh, vision contribution? Well, we know that these molecular pathways are complex in humans, are multifaceted, and evolve under multiple genetic and epigenetic influences. Uh, molecular imaging uh, has to capture this complexity by assessing multiple pathways, but we have to be able to do so in an effective uh, uh, and an efficient and cost-effective way. And in fact, uh, another one of the M plus vision teams is now innovating exactly in this domain of multiplexing uh, pet tracer detection, the ability to detect more than one tracer at a time, uh, and uh, are making uh, excellent progress. We think this is uh, potentially extremely important in the future of molecular imaging. Well, where can uh, uh, government fit in just to talk about this? In the U.S. at least, 
Uh, government does sponsor basic research. We know it does in the European Union as well, and basic engineering development. Uh, this is a key role that they play. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, the government does support and encourage uh, commercialization, even if our academic institutions are uh, somewhat uh, schizophrenic, perhaps, in uh, how they approach that. Um, small business innovation grants uh, um, uh, can be uh, helpful from the government. Uh, however, uh, that is a slow process, and as we heard about yesterday, uh, it's less good for things where you really need to be uh, into the market very quickly. Uh, but also, government can lay down grand challenges uh, that can provoke uh, innovations. And I'll just give one example of that. Again, it's another one of these big problems, uh, and that's uh, the human connectome. How do we understand how the brain is organized and wired? Uh, in fact, uh, it's interesting, but uh, of all the organs in the body, the brain is the one where we perhaps have the least knowledge, one would say almost no knowledge, of the fundamental relationship between its structure and its function. Right? The heart, we know the orientation of the muscle fibers, how they're organized in a helical structure, and how that leads to effective contraction. And we know a lot about how muscle works, even though, of course, there's much more to explore. In the brain, the basic structural organization of the brain, how it's wired, and how that subserves its underlying function is just simply unknown. The goal of the Human Connectome Project was to begin to uh, uh, peel back some of that ignorance by helping us understand uh, the un fundamental wiring diagram of the brain, both anatomically and functionally. So taking up this challenge, uh, we set out uh, with uh, our uh, corporate partners, in this case Siemens, uh, to build a very interesting system, a system that was engineered with one purpose in mind, and that's anatomical connectivity. So rather than designing a system to do everything, which is how most clinical MRs are built, they image shoulders, they image the head, they image the chest, the body, the knees, we said if you only wanted to image the connections in the brain, how, would you change, how could you change the system? Uh, and I think probably the most exciting thing about this uh, uh, slide uh, is this, the fact that this came, uh, uh, you know, that Siemens started this essentially uh, kind of in a fee-for-service but in fact adopted this project as part of their internal design and development uh, and uh, really has uh, made the partnership much, much stronger. So in terms of prerequisites and performance for this, it had to fit into a 3T scanner. We needed the signal noise, and we knew from our animal data that it had to get to this very high performance metric. This is about eight times larger than the clinical scanners that we use today. So uh, it's rare that you get an order of magnitude leap in performance, especially in instruments of this scale, but that's what we were asking for. That's what we needed. Siemens came back and actually said how to do it. They said we thought they were going to build a system just for the head. They said, no, it's actually better to build it for the whole body, just shave a little bit of, uh, off the uh, diameter. Uh, they set the uh, linearity spec uh, and together uh, came out with a spec for this system. It's a one-and-a-half-ton uh, gradient, uh, the mother of all gradients, so we like to say. And this is uh, the number, I think, of uh, merit 22 megawatts of power at peak. Um, uh, it could light a, a small city just uh, running this thing. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of current and a lot of water uh, all in a small space, which sounds like a dangerous combination, but uh, uh, this is why we needed Siemens, because this is not a system we were going to build ourselves for sure. Uh, but the result of that is a 10-time improvement over conventional MR. What has that led us to do? Well, it's allowing us to make fundamental discoveries uh, about the architecture of the brain that has changed our view of it. In fact, work of uh, colleagues like uh, Van Wadeen, both in animal systems and now in humans, has shown that the entire brain is laid out uh, like the city of Manhattan in a grid pattern with streets and avenues and, if you will, the elevators, a three-dimensional grid, um, not just in, say, the... Um, uh, the brain stem where we've known about that crossing fiber orientation, but essentially everywhere we look in the cortex, we see these three-dimensional uh, uh, grids. It's a design that was impossible to tease out using tracer studies where you inject a tracer and watch where it goes, but you would only see point-to-point -point connections. Now we could see the entire brain's wiring, and it's revealed a brand new structure. And in fact, we're able to see uh, in the period of 20 minutes with our connectome scanner in humans, the same crossing fiber architecture that it used to take us 12 hours to do and we could only do in our ex vivo scanners. So now, of course, we can begin to study uh, patients uh, with depression, patients with other mental illness, patients with traumatic brain injury, um, and uh, many other things. So uh, where does this uh, come in? Where are the opportunities for innovation? Uh, well, one is to get this kind of connectional fiber information into the operating room. Here's a, uh, a slide uh, lent to us from uh, colleagues in uh, Erlangen, again working with Siemens. Here's a large tumor. 
Uh, the MR is great for seeing the bad stuff, but when you take out that tumor, you don't want to take out the critical fiber pathways that subserve normal functions. Well, now we can do this diffusion tractography and actually look at the changes during the time of surgery uh, and uh, 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 allow us to perform the surgery uh, much safer, more aggressive to get rid of the tumor, but also avoiding the critical white matter fiber pathways. And I think, again, from an informatic standpoint, there's great opportunities for intervention. Uh, innovation, I was talking just uh, yesterday to a Spanish company uh, that has important contributions, I think, to make in this domain. The other area that we're extremely interested in is the notion of using this to look at uh, brain development, a very complex uh, uh, process uh, in the uh, uh, human. Uh, most of the gyrification and this uh, process of uh, connectoral uh, mapping uh, actually occurs uh, before birth. So we're going to have to develop a whole new set of tools to be able to do this kind of imaging uh, in utero if we're going to understand the human uh, wiring diagram. But we also want to understand what happens after that. Well, it's actually this uh, graduate student of ours, an HST student, Peng Yu, who kind of created her own personal nucleus of folks uh, at the Mass General and additional colleagues at MIT, at Harvard University, and clinicians at Children's Hospital and the MGH uh, to be able to develop, to generate those movies of the gyrification, the folding pattern of the normal brain development. Uh, but it's also led us to questions about how we might be able to sense that kind of uh, functional uh, anatomy uh, in uh, very young infants where uh, they don't like to stand still and be in large, uh, uh, loud MR scanners, but we found they are willing to use uh, light. Now, it's interesting that I have a green laser because the game won't work. If I uh, use a green laser here, you don't see anything. And of course, as the last talk uh, on optics uh, as showed, uh, green light is highly absorbed. But if this were a red laser, <laughs> you would see my finger uh, glowing uh, bright red. Just as we said, red light is transparent. Now, that was bad news for a surgical incision, but it's good news if you want to interrogate tissue like uh, the brain, because it turns out uh, that red light will go deep into the brain. The challenge is not will it penetrate into the brain, and thus can we sense it. The challenge is that it scatters many times. And so figuring out where the light comes from is the challenge, not getting light in and out of the brain. But there are a number of colleagues that are beginning to do this. And in fact, using this to study children may be the best application, frankly, because children are less thick-headed than us adults. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, here's an example where we're using this near-infrared uh, spectroscopic imaging to assess uh, oxygen uh, tension in the brain of neonates that have been suspected of perinatal brain injury. Uh, in this case, the MRI image actually shows only very subtle abnormalities, uh, but the um, uh, the image, oops, excuse me, uh, the imaging of oxygenation using optical actually showed that this baby unfortunately uh, had a very abnormal uh, uh, pattern <coughs> of oxygenation development within the entire cortex of the brain, uh, suggesting they had had a much more serious ischemic event uh, around the time of birth than was even visible on the MR scanner. Of course, the other advantage of this technology is we can take it right to the bedside and we can monitor patients uh, real time. And I think I'll have to skip over this in the interest of time. Uh, but just mention that, again, this is the kind of hardware uh, that uh, doesn't require tens of millions of dollars, uh, but uh, can be done uh, much more uh, uh, cheaply. And we've already begun to uh, disseminate this and work with small companies. And I think there are many opportunities for further innovations in this space. Uh, just uh, uh, finally, I'll just uh, make uh, uh, brief comments about the notion of uh, the use of this tool in the pharmaceutical industry, especially after this morning's comments about how important uh, the pharmaceutical industry is to R&D here in Spain. Uh, of course, uh, imaging and drug development has many important roles. Bringing new medicines uh, to patients is becoming very hard, and imaging approaches can improve success by answering critical questions. These slides are just showing how expensive it is. Uh, how long it takes to get CNS drugs in particular, how expensive they are, uh, and what the uh, success rate is, which is very poor. So the notion of biomarkers is uh, laboratory measurements that um, can be as uh, surrogates uh, to reflect changes in meaningful uh, endpoints. Uh, we would like, of course, our surrogate endpoint to be along the path of the intervention, for example, if we're measuring uh, tumor volumes and uh, certain kinds of cancers. Uh, but very often, of course, uh, the interventions completely bypass the surrogate endpoint that we might have. 
A great example of this is a uh, chest X-ray looking at pneumonia. The pneumonia has cleared, the infection has cleared from the antibiotics well before the chest X-ray clears. So in that case, it's not a perfect biomarker for the effects. The challenge is, of course, is to come up with more targeted biomarkers that are selected to the molecular events related to the disease. Here, for example, is a great example uh, looking at uh, glucose metabolism. Uh, which can show changes in uh, the uptake of uh, this uh, PET tracer for glucose uh, in just a few days, uh, literally weeks before the changes are apparent in terms of the physical uh, structure of the brain. Uh, and uh, I think I'll just uh, move on to this other example. Uh, uh, comes from the work of uh, Greg Sorensen, uh, 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 looking at uh, anti-angiogenic treatments, another domain where these technologies can be directly applied. Where do we see the opportunity for innovation? Well, certainly there's many opportunities for no novel biomarker development, looking at biophysical changes, biochemical, molecular, and physiological states, and of course involves novel molecules and novel devices. Uh, two uh, molecules have now uh, moved uh, into clinical use from the Martino Center. Uh, two different uh, MR contrast agents, one nanoparticle, uh, one a targeted uh, gadolinium contrast agent. We think many, many more, especially in the domain of PET are forthcoming. New applications for existing biomarkers. For example, that same diffusion imaging for the structure of the uh, brain can be used to understand the reordering of the heart following heart disease. And follow, uh, finally, another domain where uh, there seems to be an endless supply uh, of problems uh, in search of solutions. Uh, and that's in the uh, organized uh, informatics framework for image analysis and large-scale data mining. So with that, uh, uh, many thanks for your attention, uh, and uh, uh, we'll probably uh, not have much time for questions, so we'll have to move on.